Thank you for tuning in to Tuesdays with the Andrea podcast. In this episode, we're meeting Nicole Hutchinson Moore. She's a Texas socialite and well-paid executive who went to prison for a DUI accident that resulted in a death. Through her time there, she became aware of the needs that women are facing in the prison system, and it completely transformed her life. And now she's committed to helping women re-enter uh, the workforce, re-enter life after getting out of jail. So we're going to listen to her story. She also talks about her experience at Provo Canyon School, which is the same school that Paris Hilton talks about within her new book. Um, and so she talks about some of those patterns that exist um, and some of those undealt with issues that can lead to, to jail time. Uh, for some women in the first place. Um, but her story is fascinating, but the work that she does now is important. And I hope that you guys listen to her story and I'm, I'm excited to have her as a guest. Welcome to Tuesdays with Andrea. It's the inspiration station for everyday people guiding humanity forward. I'm your host, Andrea Rios McMillan, and every week I pursue conversations that matter with people who can relate to the common struggles we all face. You'll get to know the person behind the profession and find commonality with people of all ages, cultures, and backgrounds. Listen as friends, neighbors, and coworkers offer meaningful, personal explorations of modern life and the values we hold dear, all for the purpose of strengthening and uplifting others. Nicole, welcome. Thank you for joining us. I appreciate you for taking time to share your story and your message of the work that you're doing now. Thank you for having me. So how are you doing? How is life right now? Why don't you share with us what you're doing with Rusty Diamond Network? Sure. Well, boy, you know, that's an interesting question right now. It's been quite a ride the the last, you know, five, six months with COVID, as we all know, just crashing into all of our lives. I will say for Rusty Diamond Network, it has been one of many blessings and one of many challenges. The blessing for us has been that we've been able to provide so much for those in need. I made a choice with our team and volunteers to keep our doors wide open and be safe about it and strap on our masks and, and do what we need to do. But we have continued operations and the blessing has been that there's been so much need. So we've been able to provide that. But of course, the challenge has been that the prisons themselves have just literally been on fire with COVID. The numbers coming out of TDC have just been absolutely astounding. And I will say the TDCJ has been really reporting and providing the data so that we could see what the status is with our families and so forth of our diamonds that are incarcerated. We've been able to at least provide some information that's been good for us, but we're getting through it and we're providing a lot of services right now that are desperately needed in you know, these really challenging times. Yeah. And share with us the quick rundown of how you started the Rusty Diamond Network and, and what led to that. I was in prison. You know, actually, it was in Dallas County Jail. So I was in the jail um, and stripped down of everything, literally, that I had. And standing next to these women realized that we are all the same in this brokenness and that there was this huge gap and a need to support each other and these women that are inside and that they needed this mentorship and guidance because I, I needed it myself and that there was this huge gap in support. And I was just like them, that there was so much trauma and there was so much brokenness that was sitting right next to me and that I could relate to them. I was in such shock when I got there. Prison was not anything like what I expected it to be. And instantly I knew right then and there that the rest of my life was going to be giving back and mentoring to these women and hopefully bridging that gap also from inside prison to re-entry and returning these women to society. And from that moment on, Rusty Diamond was born. And here I am a year and a half later. And now we're really focusing a lot on the re-entry measures as well. Mm -hmm. And what got you into prison? What was the event that led to that? Oh, well, you know, the event itself 
I would say there's a lot of things that got me there. Yeah. But if you're asking a specific event, I was involved in a tragic drunk driving accident in 2015. And it was a, a horrible, tragic event. And uh, I was on bond for three years. And during that time, a lot of things happened in my life and a lot of things changed. And uh, I negotiated a, a plea deal, my, my attorneys did. And I went to a prison in 2018 and I made my first parole uh, after I was in prison for about a year and, and four months. And so at that time, it was um, a, a very difficult and life altering, life changing experience for everybody that was involved from the time of the accident all the way through the time on bond and then actually being in prison and then being released from prison. Mm -hmm. And that experience helped you to see the world within prison of the girls and what that life is like, which spurred your inspiration for the work that you do today. Oh, absolutely. Going into prison, I had no idea. Backing up a bit, when, when the accident happened, I had led such a fast-paced life. I had 25 years in corporate America and, and working for Fortune 500 companies. I grew up, I'm 48 years old, and I grew up in the dot-com and the dot-bomb. And I, I was in telecommunications and, and software and the high-flying lifestyle. And I burned the candle at both ends. And I really had blinders on to a lot of things in my own life that I was pressing so hard and uh, pushing myself. And I didn't realize that a lot of things that I had led prior in my life and in my childhood and things that had happened that I just kind of blew through to my adult life and didn't really take the time to focus on my own mental health and my own well-being and then just rushed into my adult life and literally didn't take care of myself. And all of these things in my life kind of culminated to literally making poor decisions and choices. And so when somebody asks me, what landed you in prison? What event? I kind of giggled to myself, not in a, a laugh, ha ha way, but in a, oh boy, do you have a few hours? Yes, I committed this act. This was a criminal act. This landed me in prison. But really, it's the humanity of it. It's what led to this. We know what happened, the how. But really, what is the human story behind what happened to get to this point? What happened was horrific and wrong. Somebody lost their life. I can never change that. It is wrong. I got in a car after I'd been drinking and I drove. How many people sit in front of me and say to me today, that could have been me. You know how many events I go to, you know, how many charity events or I go out to dinner, you know, it, it can happen. You know how many times we hear of these stories, somebody's in a tragic event where in a heat of passion, something happens. These are horrible, tragic events because we're human and we, in a moment of emotion or a passion or a choice, we make these decisions. We have to step back and say, what got us to this point and how do we stop this from happening? and peel it back and tell that human story. And consequences, absolutely, of course. Mm -hmm. I am not in any way saying, you know, abolish or, or get rid of consequences in our prisons. That is in no means my position at all. But do we rehabilitate? Do we take a different approach? Because what we're doing today isn't working. We've yeah. got a nationwide recidivism of 64%. It's not working. Mm -mm. And so when I was in that prison and I'm sitting right next to these girls for doing the very same things, you know, there's DWIs, there's, there's drugs, there's all these things that these women are sitting right next to me and I'm looking around and I'm going, wow, this is eye opening. This is absolutely eye opening to me because yeah. I am just like them and all this lifestyle and all these things and all, all the, they don't matter. What matters is the well-being of us. And how did we get here? Yes, there was an event that triggered it. 
how did we get here and what can we do to change that? Let's talk about that. So how did it start? Where do you think this started from? What was your early growing up years like? And did that play a factor in some of the choices that you made down the road? Um, I know you talked about that on Twitter and you talk about not dealing with trauma. So let's start there. Wow. Yes. You know, it's interesting. I'm born and raised in Dallas. I, I'm a Southern girl. My mother was just beautiful. I absolutely love my mother. I lost her when I was on bond. You know, she Sorry had, to hear uh, that. Yeah, it was just it was horrific. We were sick together and healed together. You know, I, I went to prison. She passed and went to heaven. Um, it, was a, it was a very trying time. But growing up, uh, I was adopted within my family. And it turned out to be a pretty sinister situation. Of course, as a child, I didn't really realize that. But my... Did you know uh, you were adopted? I did. I did. And I was told back in the 70s, now keep in mind, this is 1973 when I'm born. um, I was told I was picked out of a beautiful line of babies and I was special. You're wanted and chosen. Yes. So instantly as a child, I'm like, oh, I'm special and I'm a adopted and I'm picked out of this group of babies and yay is me. I'm so special. And so I grew up pretty normal thinking, okay, this is great. Anyway, long story short, I found out that the man I called dad was really my grandfather. Mm -hmm. And the woman that I called mom was really my step grandmother because she adopted me when I was a little over a year old. So fast forward all this, I've since found my biological father and I find out I have eight half siblings and I have another half sibling from my biological mother. I mean, it's just this sordid tale, right? It's Mm -hmm. like a lifetime movie plus a Hallmark movie times a horror movie, you know, it's just really complex. And so anyway, it was a lot to put on a child. And then all of a sudden that whole unit kind of disintegrated. My brothers all of a sudden disappeared. They're off, you know, and they were a lot older than me because they're really aunts and uncles. But my sister that I grew up with, we were always really close, but you know, I find out she's my aunt. So that instantly creates this internal drama and trauma for me. And I started rebelling. How old were you at that time? I was only 11. 11. And I moved schools. I was in a really exclusive private all-girls school here in Dallas. We were moving our homes at that time into a really good public school. Were you guys well um, off? Was your yes. family? My father's a neurosurgeon, but my parents were very down to earth. My parents always taught me, you earn everything. I used to earn IOUs for pulling the weeds and doing chores, but yet we had a very beautiful lifestyle. But I was always taught that we were normal and middle class. And, but looking back now, I realized we were very privileged, very. Mm-hmm. And as an adult, I realized that, but I always earned everything. You know, I'm, I'm not a trust fund baby, but did I grow up in that lifestyle? Absolutely. I saw that around me. What everybody. was that lifestyle like? <laughs> um, now I wish I'd appreciated a lot more. <laughs> was it like country <laughs> clubs and dinners and <laughs> yeah, I wish I'd appreciated it a lot more. Sitting in the boxes at the Cowboys games. That oh my God. Sure was nice. Yeah, yeah. It was very nice. And I, you know, I, the shouldas, right? I didn't appreciate it then. And I did have a sense of entitlement. And it took a lot of things for me to get humble. And I didn't know and realize that I was not. My parents had instilled that in me. My mother is the most graceful, humble human being on the planet. She was this beautiful, incredible woman, but she was always constantly squeezing and thumping and behaving. Yes, ma'am. No, you know, and I mean, I went to a finishing school. My sister made her debut. Everything was very prim and proper. But what is finishing school? Where you learn the proper manners and which fork to use with what and cotillion, where you learn the proper dancing to the different dance steps and things like that. And I went to camps and I did, I led a very privileged life. And now looking back, and I've told my father, as I've made amends and gone through the process of my recovery and those things, how appreciative I am of those things that I was not then. It took me into my forties to realize that. And it took such a fall. It took such a losing everything. I mean, completely destitute, broke, no job, 
totally just losing everything for me to realize. And that's sad. Mm -hmm. And I'm transparent about it. And I put it out there. But you know what, to share that story and to tell people and to say, it's okay. For me to be honest, I've made amends and I've been a giving, loving person, but I also know my faults. Mm -hmm. And I also know what I've not appreciated and where I've made mistakes. And if I don't face those, and if I don't I make those amends. And if I don't own up to those, then who am I? What kind of life am I going to lead? Mm-hmm. And I, I know that in prison and the people that I've met and those that have made mistakes have looked at me and said the same things. The danger is when we live our life and we point a finger at somebody else and judge and cast a stone, or we, we just deny and go, Oh, that can't happen to me. Or, oh, no, everything's great over here. We're, we're not healthy. Our, our well-being isn't being cared for. Mm-hmm. And the cycle continues. So you're uh, growing up and you're living a very privileged life. And you have, uh, albeit complicated family history, family secrets. You're a child and you're dealing with realizing everything I've been told so far was a lie. So what happens next? Where did you go from there? So I started rebelling basic stuff that then escalated, you know, lying problems in class. I obviously have a pretty big personality that didn't work so well in a private all girls school, getting sent to the teacher, the principal, my dad has a pretty quick temper. You have to have a certain disposition to be a neurosurgeon. Mm -hmm. So he didn't tolerate any misbehaviors very well. So we struggled And and as a child, that anger didn't sit well with me and my personality is you don't back me into a corner very easily. (laughs) So we were like this. They didn't know what to do in the 80s. There was this fix it mentality, especially, I think, in the way my parents are and the way my mom was with my dad. It was fix it kind of like a broken car. Let's take it and drop it off somewhere and y'all fix it. And they took and dropped me off somewhere. They took me to a psychiatric doctor in Dallas who was part of this organization called Enemy in Brookhaven. And I went twice and I sat and, and, and I don't like to swear. So and for your audience, I'm going to just, I said, F you, you can fill in the blank. And I was 12 years old and I'd gotten caught smoking a cigarette in the bathroom and throwing it in the toilet and the, the, they came in and I'd been lying and sneaking out and I'd experimented with pot a couple of times. I'd been writing notes about sexual activities, but I had not engaged in that. Typical normal teenage stuff. Yeah, yes, but it was not normal in my family. We were fighting and I was rebellious. I was having behavioral problems, not psychiatric problems. Mm. And they locked me up in a psych ward. And I was in ME, Brookhaven. How old were you? I was 12. Wow. I was 12. Tied down to a bed in restraints. I mean, it was horrific. To this day, it's still the largest mental health care lawsuit ever settled. It was with tenant health care and Brookhaven and PIA. Sick thing is a few of these doctors still practice. It's just, ugh. It's mind blowing, but we, we sued. And then the problem is I was so young. I didn't understand at the time. It was about a 300 and something million dollar lawsuit. We did get it shut down. The FBI raided. We actually got to go in and and watch them as they did it. We all stood in the parking lot. I mean, they literally, they found papers. I mean, this is years later. Was your lawsuit due to maltreatment? Oh, it was fraud, racketeering. And this is where it gets interesting. From there, I got sent to Provo Canyon School. Which is Paris Hilton. Right. Where Paris Hilton went. So they would bleed our insurance dry, maximize the, quote, care for the day, drew down all of our insurance and put us through all these crazy treatments. And then they would send us to these residential treatment centers saying we still needed further care. Well, of course, I've just spent nine months locked up in a psych ward and I'm 13 years old and my parents could afford to pay. So they had an agreement with Charter Provo at the time Charter owned Provo and I got sent there and there it was horrific. They had these things called IPS. You stand and face a wall um, for 25 minutes and it was stuff like you couldn't wear black on black because that was considered satanic. So you couldn't wear black socks with black pants or black shoes or you couldn't talk in line and then you would get these things called IPS investment periods You had to face the wall in a chair 
they had these timeout. Everything that Paris Hilton says in these videos is true. And yet that's 10 years after I was there. I was there in 87 to 89 for 16 months. I would start to finish the program and they made sure to do something, write me up for something that I would quote, lose my bed and then have to stay. What's crazy is I sued them as well in 95 with the same lawyers that, that had sued enemy and Brookhaven because there was coercion there and, and things like that. I have all the documents, all the paperwork. There's an amazing organization called Breaking Code Silence that is working with Paris Hilton to try and help to stop this. Through the years, I've, I've kept a, a, an eye on all this stuff because at the time I thought we had made a big difference. We did get the school closed. Naivety, I, I thought we had made a huge difference. I didn't realize that this stuff was still the same. I knew some things were going on, but I didn't realize the exact same stories 20 years later. I'm just sitting in, in the house and all of a sudden I hear Paris Hilton and Provo Canyons. I mean, my head just snaps on a swivel. I went into an instant almost PTSD reaction, like I, that I, this can't be real. And I start reading this stuff and looking and I'm in shock. And then I go on Facebook and Twitter and I start seeing all these stories and I'm getting chills. These, some of these kids have been out 2017, 2018, 2019. And I'm going, what? And as a 48 year old, I'm floored. I'm fuming. I'm hurt, uh, but I, I get it. And I'm sitting here going, okay, God, yet again, here we go with another piece of this puzzle. What did your parents say when you were telling them, hey, this isn't working? I'm not being Well, first of all, we couldn't tell them while we were in there. We were threatened. I have the letters. I have the actual letters they wrote to my parents and what they were saying to them. And yet then what they were doing to me, especially when I'd lose my bed, when I was supposed to be coming home and then something would happen. I mean, it was just nuts. So when I told my parents after the fact, well, the beauty of it is when I slid the check in front of my parents and said, look at this, when the settlement happened, because I like I was right. I felt validated. It was like, yes. Now when I'm talking to people from breaking code silence, or this is finally vindicating. And the thing about it is, is to have that years, I didn't trust anybody in mental health care. How could I? And still I have nightmares. And so that's what caught me and why I got chills. And I hear Paris Hilton or other survivors, these thousands of survivors. I'm on these groups on Facebook and we're all sharing. And 20 years later, we're still having these feelings and these nightmares. And these th- It's like, that is so telling. But that is why it's so important that we take a different approach and we say, look, there is hope and, and there is a different way. And again, I go back to what I, I'm just like <laughs> on repeat. Consequences, yes. Accountability, yes. But how we make the change is that we look at how we handle our health and our mental health and well being every day. So, yes, do we have accountability and consequences? Yes. But what we do with teenagers and children, instead of just dropping them off to fix it, We've got to put regulations in place and we've got to deal with these traumas. And especially now, I mean, it's got to be so scary to be a parent in this world. I just about every one of my friends is a parent. And at this age now, most of their kids are all teenagers and and they come to me because they know what I've experienced. I'm very transparent and open about all this stuff. Now, of course, I'm all over everything with the social media. We've got to do this different. We have brokenness, traumas or hurts. It's, It's what we do with it going forward. Yeah. We've got to do it a different way. It's a beautiful time in our society and humanity to be out here saying things have got to change. Things have got to change. But, but let's do it through showing them how in living the life. I was here. I'm here now because it works. Right. Rusty Diamond, we've got zero recidivism. Now, I know that number can change. I'm not hanging my hat to say, okay, we're perfect. <laughs> we're not going back to prison. You know, of course, that's our goal. The goal is that we're leading meaningful lives because we're making the right choices, because we're taking care of our mental health, because we have a network of support. Back to the Provo incident, your parents, they thought that was the right solution for you. What is it that you needed instead? What would have been the ideal solution? Well, first off, somebody to actually listen. So when you put dollars and cents as somebody's priority, they're chasing the wrong rabbit. So they're not listening to me to understand me. They're thinking about their end goal 
of what's in it for them. So we've got the cart flipped. So I'm not saying there's not people out there that are concerned and understanding, but when you have an industry like these residential treatment facilities that are unregulated, Mm -hmm. there's nobody out there watching the chicken coop. So everybody's going wild out there chasing the dollars. There's no restrictions for funding. There's no accountability factors. That's what you're saying. You have a license, hang a shingle. There's your school. There you go. Call it a school and and gum drop the kid off. Yes, we've got to change that. And then two, using our voices and saying, hey, my, my child was helped here. We specialize in this kind of help and we've referred 10 people here and it's worked for us. Village, community, and breaking the barriers of shame breaking the barriers to say it's okay. We put all these things out to say it's National Suicide Prevention Month. It's this month. It's this day to recognize it. That's great. That's a start. But let's encourage people to come out here and say, here's my story. Here's what's helped me. And here's who helped me. Here is the network that helped me. Come come seek us. We seek you. And that's what's going to make the difference. But until the money chasers are held accountable and regulated, it's going to keep going. What happened with Brookhaven and Provo, they just kept selling. And and it was counselors that would leave and then go hang a shingle and just keep going and keep going. What age were you when you got out? I was 17, counting the days till I turned 18. (laughs) And then what happened? I struggled and made it through every possible day I could. And the second I turned 18, I threw a bag out my window and ran away. And, and I, I didn't go back. And it took several years to repair the relationship with my parents. And it was tedious at best. I started a cycle of marriages and I didn't get help. And I repeated a cycle of trauma and PTSD behaviors and compounded yet again in my adult life. And that is where my drinking began. Mm -hmm. And that was my outlet. The wine just started flowing and I got real successful in, in corporate America. I started with nothing on a telephone in a call center and boy, did that phone love me. And I loved that phone. Sales was my calling. And I was 18 years old. I lived in a, a motel six with no car, nothing, but boy, that phone was it for me. That was my way out. And I've seen it with so many others too. When you are driven and you have a passion and you know you want to make something of yourself. I didn't have my parents at that point in my life. And I had just come out of all that trauma. I had been through with the Brookhaven and Provo and I was on my own and I didn't have two nickels and I knew I was going to make it. And life was good in the beginning there. And then I repaired things, but you know, it was just waiting for me. It was just waiting for me. Money and success was not the be all end all. No. It was not. There's a few articles that, that call you a socialite, right? Dallas yeah. socialite. What was socialite life like? How did you rise to status? I made sure to separate myself from my parents in that regard. So I rescued dogs and I got involved with a great group of gals and an organization uh, here in Dallas, Paws in the City, the SBCA, and my heart just overflowed for these dogs. And I started getting uh, involved in the adoptions, the fundraising. I had watched my mom campaign for previous presidents. My parents had done the inaugurations. I was stuffing envelopes as a little kid. My mom was a founder for most of the charities here in Dallas, a lot of the great... Gateway, Family Place, all these places, Crystal Charity. My mom was involved in all this stuff. So it was in my blood. I mean, that was my mom's career. She had her own office and and she worked for free. My mom did this for the good of humanity. So, I mean, it was a part of who I was. And so as an adult, though, I wanted to give back and be involved in that. But my own thing, right? Not associated with my mom's. So animals, with that came the little red carpet, send the fundraising events and the adoption events. We had to raise money. And a lot of the girls that were involved in that were involved in other endeavors that were some reality TV stuff, some modeling. And so I was just kind of involved in that world a little bit. And I think that's where, and probably where my family background came from too, where that kind of tied together. 
I didn't realize as I was in it, how I was feeling though. And what I kind of got sucked into with the drama and then my career, my career was always number one. I was in a man's world and I was, <laughs> my Facebook still says sales shark. When I set up my sales book in 2007, like in the toolbar, I don't know how that works, but I giggle every time I see that. Cause I'm like, wow, really? You know, I was so proud of being this woman that just commanded the room and could just come in and knock the socks off the CEO and the CIO. And cause I got really involved in, in, the entire organization because I was selling very complex software solutions. So I had to understand the entire inner workings of an organization. And these are complex solutions, analytics and contact center and telephony. And I got very involved in the cloud and I was very early on in that. And I got a lot of extensive certifications and trainings. So it was exciting. And very few women were in that world and wanted to be. So coupled that, and I was traveling a hundred and something to almost 200,000 miles a year. I had sales teams, technical teams. I was in global organizations. So and alcohol by that time is probably flowing. Alcohol's flowing. We had cars and yeah, it was crazy. So I got full of myself very quick without realizing it. And the ego, all my teams, my employees managing their lives and and their things, trying to keep the, the leads flowing, you know, when I was in charge of telebusiness and, and responsible for feeding all the outside sales guys, their deals and business. I mean, it just got, and, and I had an amazing boss at Oracle who, who pulled me aside and said, Nicole, you are one of the best inside sales and outside sales team managers I've ever had, but your drinking has got to stop. And this is back into right after 9-11. And I mean, that's 2001. And to this day, I will never forget. She's the best boss I've ever, ever had. She's incredible. And she made it way up in Oracle. And she was the vice president of sales. And it just incredible woman. Shout out incredible. to bosses like her, right? Shout out. I mean, and that's the one call, like still to this day, I'm like, I have got to call this woman. But yes, and she was such a mentor and a role model. And even then, though, I wasn't at that point still to be healthy enough to go, okay, I've got to listen to this incredible woman who's telling me, because I wanted to be a CEO. That was my ultimate goal. I wanted to lead an organization to greatness Mm -hmm. and do amazing in that corporate arena. I woke up in 2013 with my social life in a shambles, my love life in a shambles, my family life in a shambles everything. And I didn't know what to do. So I did what I do best. I pulled the plug overnight. I told my boss, come and get this damn laptop. I left a well over a six figure year job. I literally had been in the bathtub with a gun sitting on the kitchen table and a letter. And I said, I cannot do this life anymore. I blocked and deleted. I don't even know how many of my friends on my Facebook. I literally was a basket case. And I knew at that time, even then, things have got to change. And I went quiet for a while. And then I went to start my own little business and shut down, changed some things, got rid of some toxic people, was starting to kind of get myself together and, you know, got myself in a more affordable house and kind of made some adjustments, but I still just hadn't really hit that bottom to say, God, you take the wheel. I was still trying to control that wheel way too much. And then literally he did in May of 15. Mm. And that was when the um, accident happened, correct? Correct. Talk to us about as much as you can. I know that this is sensitive. So share with us what happened next. Well, um, somebody lost their life and it's a horrible tragedy. The thing that I like to express to people is It's dangerous when we sit and we look at anybody else in their life and say, wow, how could you have done that? I see things that are said about me at times. I try not to dig too deep into that. And when I think about anything that somebody's done in their life that is horrible or that I might want to cast judgment on, I always think about that. But what can we do better? What can I do better? I can't change that. I can't change the choice I made or the decision or the circumstances. And I'm not there in that situation for that other person. But what I can do 
is what I'm left with. And what I'm left with is right now, mm-hmm. is today. How did you deal with being responsible for the loss of life from another person? Well, I went to prison. <laughs> and prison is a terrible, terrible place. As much as I am a positive person and I talk about the beauty of prison, prison is a terrible place. And when I say the beauty of prison, I mean the women. I choose to look at things from this is, you know, half full. It's not empty. That's the way I choose to live life. But the reality is it's not always rainbows and unicorns. I fight a lot for justice reform. So I went to prison and I did my time and I'm on parole. I still have a lot of responsibilities to the state for my actions. And I take that incredibly seriously. But the bottom line is (laughs) there is only one thing that I can control. There's only one thing that I can do every day. And guilt is not one of them. Shame is not one of them. God takes that for me every day. What I can do is my actions. What I can do is paying it forward. Shame is a very dangerous thing for me. And I would venture to say if we're a human being, we've all sinned and we've all had things in our lives that we regret and and always wish we could take back. But a moment lived in shame is a moment lived that we're not doing something to move forward from that and hopefully something that's making our lives better and our lives better for someone else. Mm -hmm. And you take accountability and you've served time and you've faced the consequences. And I think that's the important part is the learning of this is my behavior, but this is not who I am. And in fact, I have a choice now to make life worthy of why I'm still here. Did I say it okay? That is a very good way to put that. Absolutely. Yes. So what was it like during the process of sentencing and then going to prison? What was the response of everyone else around you, your parents and your family, your coworkers? Did it, what happened during that time? Well, I had gone very dark, meaning I wasn't in hiding. I had been in three years of therapy, church. I was not on social media. I mean, I didn't come back on social media until this past January. I had a very small circle. Let's put it that way. I was working for my dad and my mom, who I was taking care of 24 hours a day with her dementia. So I didn't have any coworkers. As I say that, the beautiful people in the facility that my mom was in, but it was life shattering and altering to go through the entire judicial process. It's part of why I advocate. I know firsthand the sentencing process and the entire bond process. I have seen the court system in a way I hope not many have to experience. Even if you've had a traffic ticket, you know how frustrating it can be. Yeah. We'll multiply that when you're facing up to 20 years in prison. It's a very interesting experience. It, it was very enlightening. I am very passionate about sentence reform. I've got some diamonds that are incarcerated on a first time felony for 25 years for gummy bear marijuana. Yeah. Um, yeah marijuana is legal in some states. So for me personally, the sentencing process was absolutely brutal. I will say the beauty of it, and I I don't talk about this very much because I'm not allowed to talk about the victim and the victim's family in the sentencing process was the only interaction that there was any interaction there. That was beautiful for me. That was healing. um, And I hope it was healing for them as well. Mm. So that is one thing that is good in the courts, but the rest of it, oh, we have got to change the entire court process because there is no fair due process allowed. It is all a game between prosecutors and DAs. And now Dallas County is like 95%, 97% of cases plea, meaning there's no trials. There's no negotiation of anybody but the lawyers to all sit around their coffee and water coolers together and talk. So it it is such an unfair process. And yet they're putting people behind bars. Again, this goes to my cycle of 64% recidivism and what we're doing to our citizens, our fellow citizens in our community and putting them in these prisons when, you know, again, fix it. 
This is the yeah. same thing we're doing for our children. Yeah, fix them, fix, fix them. them. There's no fixing. And then you go in and you, you're going to come out. That's the other part. They're coming 95% out. 95% <laughs> are coming out. Yeah. And they're coming out wildly self-destructive, wildly. Had I not been what and how, I was so grounded. I was the healthiest I've ever been when I went to prison. I went in knowing I was going. I, I made yeah. an agreement for 30 days to get my stuff together. You know, when I went to sentencing, we knew. I mean, we had packed it. I knew exactly what I was doing that day. I knew when I left my house, I wasn't coming home. I knew what potentially the time was. I mean, I already, we knew everything. But my gosh, had I not, I could have come out being, I could have not come out. I could have committed suicide in there. There were days it was so dark in there, even in the condition I had gone in with, with my spirituality and my health. There was days with no air conditioning, no heating, the water, the sewage, the screaming, the yelling. It is so horrific the way we treat our human beings. I mean, you're talking about Texas with no AC. It got up to 117 in those dorms. I literally fainted at the doorway on a concrete floor. I mean, it is just horrific. And again, I'm not trying consequences, accountability. Yes. Yeah. How are you going about this? No. The majority of our population in these prisons, by the way, people think, oh, they're murderers and baby killers and they're this and that makes me so riled up. And you know what? I had that thought too before I went in. I feel you. I get you. When I hear that, the first thing I say to people is, yep, people don't want to say that out loud. I feel you. I got you. But you know what? I was in there too. They look at me and they go, you went to prison. I'm like, it's okay. I ain't judging, just saying. I went to prison too. It happened to me too. I did it too. Yes, it happens. And it really is unbelievable. Somebody will look at me and they're like, oh, you're a white girl. Yep. Uh-huh. You want to go there? We can have that conversation too. I'm ready for it. Let's go. It, let's go. Let's have the conversation because those are the conversations we need to have. It happens all across the board. What were they in there mm -hmm. for? So if they're not killers and baby stealers, what are they in there for? Yeah. So many in there are drugs and DWIs, drugs, DWIs. And I will tell you the majority. And I don't know if you can see that little pile back there. That's just one little pile that I've still got to sort through of letters. But, you know, we get dozens and dozens and dozens of letters a week from the girls inside. And I have my little thing down here that I actually like sort. And I actually do put, because a lot of them tell me their story. And then we go in and get our new diamonds that way that aren't just, you know, the girls are referred. And the majority of them, God help me, there's some kind of man involved or their child. So they got tripped up in something. Now they made the choice, yeah. right? But it's drugs and there's some other circumstance. So again, they're not leading that meaningful life, right? There is something in there that has triggered them to make that choice. So yes, they are accountable, but it's not like they just went out and blew up that house or, or, or wrecked that car or no, they took a charge for this guy or, you know, like this situation was the gummy bears that I was talking about her and her son and her husband are all involved in this situation. So there was a family issue that happened there. The DWIs is untreated substance abuse. Don't have the money and the resources. Don't know where to go. They need somebody to mentor them. I always tell them it's a bowling alley and I'm the bumper guards. They got to roll the ball, but I'll keep them in the lane, right? Mm -hmm. But they don't even have the bowling alley. They don't know where to go, right? So a lot of it has to just knowing the resources and having somebody to just coach them, life coach them, guide them, be there for them, love them unconditionally to keep them in that straight and narrow where they, they'll still bounce, but they got kind of a little soft landing pad. And most of them, it has to do with some kind of substance abuse or something to do with the relationship, familiar and, or romantic. And then is class also a factor or socioeconomic status? Are these low income people where they don't have the means to make better choices or no, it's pretty much an even mix. Uh, it's a combination, but it depends. It's interesting. DWIs very much. It's a mix very much. When you step outside of the DWI and you get more into the substance abuse, but especially when you get into the familial, it is definitely socioeconomic based. 
But when you get into the DWIs, I would say it, it seemed more lack of a better word. I hate to use this term, but let's be blunt. It seems more fair, right? Yeah. It seems like the, the DWI and some of the substance abuse, but when you got into the familial stuff, absolutely. I would get so frustrated when I read these letters and then the girls that I met, it is definitely a socioeconomic issue. And, you know, I see things like, oh, we're in our communities doing this. We're in our, well, where are you when it comes time to sentencing? We've got to get ahead of this at sentencing before that time. We need to be partnered with the DAs. We need to be partnered prior to this stuff to say, and there's a couple of judges that, oh, they're just wonderful here in Dallas with these diversions to say, you know what, instead of, okay, let's keep sending them in because I'll look up some of these girls and I'll see they have 11 because you can look in the the computer and see they have 11 felonies. One year here, one year here. What is one year going to do them in prison? Let me tell you, you get prison the first day you walk in the door. You get it in the county jail, especially in Dallas County, one of the roughest ones. What do you mean by that? Meaning the first time you're strip searched and told to do that and and you go through all of that and you're shackled and you're sprayed down with the lice and all that stuff. You get it. The first time they put that slop in front of you, let me tell you, you get it. You get it. So there's all kinds of studies. And here's the, this is the difference too, like what I was talking about with the residential treatment and prisons. And I sit on the board of the Texas Justice Initiative, which is incredible out of Austin. We, we have all the data for police, for police and law enforcement and for criminal justice. So, and I'm a data gal, obviously, because you know, that's what I did in my career. There's no data in these residential that there is in prisons. So like you can look and see any kind of study you want to see, all understand, look, and again, these are numbers, but I look at them differently because I lived it. So yeah. when I see that data, I see the life behind that data. And you look and you see recidivism rates, And you compare that recidivism rate and the length of a sentence. And then there's this whole argument around violent, nonviolent and all that. I won't even get into that here. But you look and you compare and you really do the analysis and understand. And then coming from somebody that's lived it and been through it, it, it's just astounding. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they get it. So take this funding and take resources to a restorative justice and a rehabilitative justice And then back to childhood trauma, which all of these women have it, sexual trauma from their childhood. I'd sit in these groups and in these programs. Literally, I didn't think things could make, I mean, I've been in meetings with sales guys, the cuss words I didn't even know existed. And I know them all. These women, their stories taught the things they would say. Another human being should never experience. So the line of victim and victimization is so reversed and flipped when I'm sitting in that prison going, wow, no wonder she's sitting next to me in this group. She was going to come to prison. It was just a matter of time. This woman was going to snap and something was going to happen. And again, not justifying it, not, you know, accountability. Yes. But what could we have done on that front end in her community or prior to her coming in this door of prison to stop that because now what we're doing too is we're compounding. She just got beat up in the shower five minutes ago and attacked by two women. Really? How's she going to come out? Cause she's coming out. She's sitting in this program because she made an FI six, which means she's coming out of prison. Talk about that part. Were you scared in jail? Were you worried in jail? And how does that mess with your mentality? How do you build a mentality to survive? I wasn't scared. I walked in and the very first day, and she's still a diamond with me today from Dallas County. Um, I was in psych. They put me in the psychiatric ward thingy. You're in a glass bowl, uh, all glass walls, everything's open. Anna, I'll use her nickname, walks up to me and she's like, you're going to be okay. And I said, I'm going to be okay. Now this is after I sat for 10 hours in a chair and all that. The only time I was scared was the 90 mile an hour van ride from Dallas County to TDCJ and the initial intake at TDCJ was horrific. I was scared of the staff and the guards. I was not scared of the women. Did that shock you? I've never in my life experienced such a degrading, disgraceful attack on women's character in my life. Plain State Jail is absolutely the most horrific, disgusting hell on earth. 
I've never been called the C word, racial slurs at me, other women from the staff. I, that jail needs to be worms. I mean, the, the physical I have never experienced in my life versus going to a private prison, Lockhart, where I literally fell out of the van and kissed the concrete ground as I'm shackled at my wrists and my ankles. And the lady swoops me up and literally pulls me up. And she says, I understand you're okay. You're at Lockhart now. I will never forget that. And then she's the first one that took a picture that I still have in my bathroom of my husband and I at our first visit at Lockhart. So, I mean, it is just the disparity too between the units. It's unbelievable. I never had a fear. Now, as I say that my girls that are at certain units, that's not the case. There are certain units that are rougher and that's where they have the lifers, women that do have murder sentences that are not going to see parole for 20 something years. But I will tell you, those are some of the women I have in these letters. They're some of the most beautiful women you've ever seen because they have such time to get spiritual and they have such time. Those that use it, you know, it's also what you do with the time. And those are the women that I can tell in these letters that are reaching out to me that they know they're not going to be getting out for reentry. Why are they using that stamp to write to me? It's mm. not for reentry resources. They're sitting on a 25, 30 year sentence. They just want somebody to love them and to communicate with them. Yeah. And you said use that stamp because in jail, everything is scarce. You don't have the money. And if you're not working because you're in jail, so you're not working and bringing an income, you're pretty much at the mercy of either family members who are willing to support you and send money. I don't know what other way that you can make commissary. Talk about that portion of jail. It's horrible. People think, and, and I see this a stigma as well. People say, oh, well, they get free room and board. You know, what do you mean? It's, it, it's punishment. I'm out here trying to make it. <laughs> it's the furthest thing from the food is barely edible. And again, there's some units that it's okay because they might have a farm there or something. And it's the same thing all the time. It's a potato or a carrot that's from the farm right there. But you know, you don't expect, and again, you don't expect it to be, but at least to be edible, not to have maggots or mold. And then what they've been going through with COVID, we could spend an hour just talking about some of the yeah. cell phone footage that, that they've gotten in coming out of there. It's just incredible. But, um, cause they've been on lockdown mm -hmm. so much there where they bagged food. That's just, oh my gosh. But bottom line is <laughs> it is so expensive. You get $300 in Texas a month and that is to buy toilet paper. They give you two rolls of toilet paper that's supposed to last you. I don't know if you think about how much toilet paper that you use. And it's quite interesting that God and, and the world has been through what we've been through. And, and God has delivered some very funny things in my head. Yeah, because <laughs> toilet paper literally became gold for everyone during the pandemic. Like, oh my God, we do you have toilet paper? No, do you have toilet paper? Can you imagine what the diamonds and I we're texting, we're like, now everybody gets it. Now everybody knows what it's like because in prison, to trade a, a roll of toilet paper costs 50 cents. One roll of toilet paper is 50 cents in prison. So if you think about 300 a month, everybody goes, gosh, that's a lot. That's for toothpaste, toilet paper, food, because the only thing I put on, okay, I'm normally like 125, 30 pounds. I'm still trying to battle this last you know, 15 we're, pounds. We're, we're all doing trying. <laughs> From a year and a half ago, right? I know. So it's like, really, seriously? I know. But I got up to 185 pounds in there, 185. And I'm five foot two on my little body. It's because I literally, the only thing I could eat was a tortilla off the thing and beans. And rice and all this, there was just junk and cookies. Everything's a carb. And literally the next thing I know, my uniform is going from extra small to extra large. It was so unhealthy. I'm on an inhaler. I can't even carry, which we're required to carry our belongings in this bag for lockdowns. And I'm falling over, begging the guard, please help me, please. I, I need somebody to help, allowed to help me. And I'm wheezing. Well, I realize it's because I put on all this weight and I'm all of a sudden so unhealthy. I'm like, when did this happen? And it's the junk. So now, as I say that, you know, and everybody wants to slam private prisons and I get it with the money and the exchanges and the politics, and all, whatever. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about as somebody that went to a program-based private prison here in Texas at Lockhart. 
all of a sudden I walked in and I had lettuce for the first time I'd had in nine months. You thought I'd won the lottery. I ate that lettuce like it was, I mean, my body even responded. I, it, was, <laughs> it was the most incredible feeling in the world to have a piece of lettuce. You know, imagine not having lettuce for nine months, a vegetable. I had not had any vegetables, zero, none, because I was at Plain State that whole time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, how do we expect our people to go into prison and 95% of all people, that's men and women, are going to get out? And then we go, okay, you've been fixed, and now you come out and live next door to me. And we treat them like this. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about reentry. Now you serve your time. My favorite. You do your time and now you're going to get out. First, talk to us about what the preparation process for getting out is like. Did you go through any type of program or classes or I don't don't know what they do? Just hearing that is like freedom. Like that's so exciting to hear. Like I I literally, I love to talk about reentry because that's the most exciting part about what I do. It's the most special part, but also my life. That day I posted a video. I don't know if you saw it. I kind of snuck it onto my Facebook and Twitter because I don't know how people are going to react. My husband filmed when I got in the car and it's hysterical because he's driving up through the line and he's clicking the unlock, 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 unlock. Cause we have automatic doors <laughs> and all you hear is click, 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 click. And him in the car. And then me, like literally I'm like <laughs> waddling up, carrying all my stuff in these mismatched clothes that don't really fit me. And I'm going, Hey, and he's going, hi baby. And the guard is standing there and she's like, make a left on your way out. And as we pull away, he goes, just for that, I'm taking a right. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm looking at him and I'm like going, so this is the world. And then the video kind of like shuts off and I don't litter. But I literally am like throwing my glasses, the the commissary glasses. I think I threw them. I was just so like in a state of shock, like out the window. And I'm just like looking and going, this is the world. I hadn't been outside. And I think I really only went outside about maybe eight or nine times when the whole time I was locked up because I just, if things happened, they happened on the rec yard. You know, I never wanted to really be out there. I think I did a race and that's about it for a Christian group that came, but it's reentry is the most important thing. And with reentry, we don't start reentry in the prison system until literally We're about a few months out, maybe at best, unless you get what's called a parole answer. Like I had mentioned earlier in FI6. Okay, so I got blessed and somehow I ended up in a parole answer program. So I didn't have my parole answer yet, but I ended up in the DWI program. And it was very difficult because it was very high pressure and high drama and it's a prison, yeah. even though it's supposed to be this program. So there was a lot of transition, a lot of things happening. However, it's a great start to where we need to be with these types of programs in our prisons. And it is a foundation for where I think programs could get like this before prison and in prisons to help reduce the prison population and help us with reentry. So reentry should be from before you even hit the prison doors. Everybody that does go into prison should have a reentry program already established. We don't today. And you mean These program, should, you mean a plan, a plan for reentry? Yes. Okay. Yes. And some of the things that I would propose for legislation would be just that. Reentry should be decided literally before. So when you come into prison, they do this bogus thing called a program plan for you. It's not. It's basically a lieutenant and some people sit around and classification basically outlines, okay, she needs to do this, this, and this, but it's not truly a program restorative plan for you, a rehabilitation. It's based on your criminal profile. We need to change that. So I kind of have an outline and I come in with Rusty Diamond and I do it on my own. I'm not officially partnered with TDCJ right now. I've spoken with them and I'm going to work on a proposal. I've, I've been working on it to officially partner with them to where I can bring this with the programs and we can say, okay, let's put reentry at the forefront because this is critical. We're not giving these people any reentry. We're opening those gates and going by. And unless they have a parole answer that says 
You have to do DWI. You have to do the drug program. You have to do the sex offender program. There's a chart that you can look at on Texas Department of Criminal Justice that says, okay, here's all the programs that fall under educational, vocational, and then the the rehabilitation programs. Mm -hmm. Unless you're assigned or do those or you elect to get into those, you don't get them. Mm -hmm. No. So this is really critical. So I've made sure that for Rusty Diamond, the girls that I can grab that are diamonds and, and fit in well to our network, I'm going in and saying, hey, go get into this program and I'll mentor you. Do the girls Do know, know about the, the, the programs that are available to them while they're in jail? Some do, some don't. And it depends on what unit they're on because not all programs are at all unit. That's where I come in. So once they're in my network, I know what programs are at what units. And then even a lot of times I'll call. And that's how I actually made the introduction on the outside even though I knew them from the inside and was in their programs, I called because I was calling on behalf of a diamond and I was upset that I was going to pay for her college education for her to go into this program. And they were denying her. So I picked up the phone and I called the head guy. And then the next thing you know, he's like, wait a minute, we need your program. And I was like, well, as a matter of fact, and that's kind of how the conversation got going. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's amazing how that kind of works. And what does your program do? There's a process to get set up with the prisons So I get these letters, uh, referrals. They call me Mama Diamond in the prison. And the girls kind of all talk. And they're like, hey, have you heard about this girl, Nicole? She used to be inside. Mama Diamond, she's got this program where she will write to you. She'll JPay you. If you get to a point, she'll put you on her phone list. And she'll coach you and mentor you. She'll help you with your parole. She'll talk to your family. Some of the girls, depending on where they are too in their recovery, like if I've got them doing some 12 step stuff, I use celebrate recovery in our program and then augment with some other things. So depending on what their issues are, what they're working on, some trauma work, things like that. And I have my mentors that help and coach and guide me and that I'll go to. And so really it's a village Mm -hmm. and we support the girls while they're in. And then I stay with them, meaning I'm coaching and helping them while they're in. And then all the way through to when they're out, I even pick them up at the bus stop. So if they don't have anybody picking them up, my husband and I, we go and we've stayed open through all of COVID. We've been picking them up, getting them. I have my incredible neighbors, my neighborhood app, Facebook, we're grassroots, we're self-funded right now. We've been just scraping by with our income, my husband, donations from just local people here. And we give clothes, food. We've been a food pantry. People have been dropping off boxes and boxes of those kind of things. So we set them up with their hygiene, their clothes, their food. When they get out, think of, they have nothing. No, they have I, nothing. They're coming out with what they're wearing. Talk they're about that bad. part. Talk about that part, coming out with nothing and what that is like. And especially during COVID times. Literally, we went to the store and I will never forget one of my favorite best girls who I was in with, Kiki. She came and she loves ribs. So my husband and I were like, you know what? Let's splurge on this one. Let's go buy her some ribs. Oh, I'm going to cry. So when she gets out, she can make ribs with her dad. And they were going to drive all the way to Tyler. So we went and met them at the bus stop and people dropped off. So I did a special posting. So like when a girl's coming out, I'll do a special post in my next door app. We have a pretty big community here and they're just amazing. And I decided, you know what, I'm going to share my story. I'm transparent. I'm an open book. You know, it is what it is. And I put it out there. So, and everybody's responded amazing. And I said, I've got this girl. She's coming out. Here's a little bit about her story. The next thing I know, clothes galore out here, even for her kids and everything. And we went and bought the ribs. And I know all the sides that she likes. And we had all the food. And we took it. We're in mass. One of the pictures I have is of she and I kind of like this at a distance hug. And, you know, we just make it work. COVID or not, listen, I'm going to pull myself up by my bootstraps. And I'm going to find a way any way I can to make this stuff work because nothing's going to stop us. And we're just going to find a way what we all say to each other when anything comes up or something happens is we've been to prison. We're going to make it work and we're going to find a way because we had to, we know how to make anything out of a piece of toilet paper, a piece of cardboard. We made birthday cakes in there with cream cheese. We can make this work in the time of COVID. That's the kind of attitude we have. And explain the need though, for other people to understand what it's like to get out and 
what they don't have. Like why is your support so important is because a lot of times they have what a hundred bucks and then a, and a state offender card. How do you move on if you don't have support, if you don't have a place to go, or if you don't have a job? So the hardest thing, people always think it's housing. That is probably number two, but the hardest thing is they do not have identification. They have a state offender's ID. I myself, that's all I had. My driver's license had expired and I didn't renew it. I hadn't driven in five years. So they are coming out, no place to live. Sometimes they might have a family member they're going to, because if they're on parole, they have to have some address, right? So a lot Mm -hmm. of times I might be taking them to the halfway house. We drive and drop them off there until we're trying to find them a place to live. It is so hard because they have no identification besides something that says offender. Yeah offender in bright red, Texas identification offender. Well, who's going to want to do anything with you that says offender on your identification first off and no bank. So it's really critical uh, before you even get out, which is what we do a plan in place for those key things. How am I going to get an identification? What is my plan for where I'm living? What is my plan for a job? What is my plan for finances? And in that finances is also food stamps, any government assistance, any of those things that you can sign how to do those things. So we provide assistance to make sure all of those things are lined up. And if we're not the ones that are doing it, then I'm coordinating with whatever that family member is. If they do have that support to get those things done, it is so hard. Now I will say that in COVID, The blessings, like what I was talking about earlier, the blessing for us has been these girls are hustlers. They are out here doing the jobs that people that are on unemployment or don't want to in COVID, these girls are doing them. I've got girls working at Denny's, grocery stores, and the girls are getting promoted because there aren't people working. So they're having to get promoted faster while other new people are coming in under them. So I've got girls now that are already store managers, night managers at restaurants, you know, things like that. So the blessing for them has been there has been a lot more employment available for them and more opportunity within that employment. Sadly, though, it's because of the state of the economy and where we are with COVID. But and I've told them you guys, pardon the way this sounds, but you guys ride that wave while you can right now. And let's hope that we're proving that these guys make great employees because they know they've got to work extra hard. They know they've got to prove themselves to you employers. So hire them because they are amazing employees because they know they got to have a little extra pep in their step Mm -hmm. and show you their game, you know, really get in there. But because of that, boy, they, they want that job. They're going to hold on to that job. Is that hard? Is it hard to find them those jobs? Is it hard to get employers to hire them and to trust them? You know, there's amazing organizations. There's Cornbread Hustle. There's people here in in the Dallas area. I'm finding it much harder. I've got girls in Amarillo. These are places I'm calling out kind of in Texas, but, you know, that's my main focus in the rural areas. But what's really hard is, okay, now we're making these strides. We're kind of punching through that ceiling. Why are we stuck, though, in, and I'm not negating this, but again, socioeconomics, these girls, let's go to sales now. I'm getting these girls into call centers to start there. Okay, prove that you can get on that phone and you can make that sale. You can call into that real estate. I've got a, a call center here that does some distressed properties and now they prove themselves that they're cold calling and getting in there. Now they're moving over to calling on realtors, right? Okay, they're doing great. They're keep progressing them. But let's break through that ceiling too. They can have careers, not just jobs. Why am I any different? I left home at 18. Yeah, I had this great education up until that point. I didn't get my college degree. I got my GED on my own when I was out. Why are they any different? If they get in there and they prove themselves, and I ended up with a career that paid me over $200,000 a year, I got out there and hustled and made it. Why can't they? So now let's break through that barrier. And I'm kind of in that same boat now for myself. I'm not drawing an income. I'm not getting paid. I've got to start getting to that point for myself. So I'm looking at those avenues. Where am I going to create that for myself too? Yes, of course, I've got my nonprofit in Rusty Diamond, 
why can't I break that ceiling as well? I think we've got to look at that and say, okay, this is wonderful. There are all these, what we're calling now frontline or essential workers, but all of these guys have to have this potential to also have a career. Yeah. And to make family sustaining wages, we want them to grow and thrive economically as well as personally. Economics is important. Yeah. You know, these career ending move. Yes, we all make mistakes. It's so hard to see that somebody has a DWI and all of a sudden they get blasted all over the media. We had a local news anchor here and thank God she didn't hit somebody. And I've seen her career be able to come back, but it took probably about five years but we don't also think about the, what that impact. Now, she didn't go to prison, right? But she lost, you know, everything. Now, I'm not in her checkbook. I don't see that. I'm not in her day-to-day life. And I do know her. We, we interacted some in, in the charity world. But it's like to see this attack and this fall from grace instead of grace. Why do we not go wow, that could have been me. Wow. Look what happened to her. Why can't I learn? And I get it. I mean, we're human. We're going to be, you know, we might take a a jab and a stab, but what is that doing to move us forward? I hear what you were saying about we need more grace and the women who are coming out still need opportunity to grow and advance as you've seen with your own personal experience. So now what, what's the answer? What is the hope? What can we do now? Boy, isn't that the great question? You know, I I ask myself that quite often because obviously this can get dark sometimes for me. It can get overwhelming. I have to constantly be like, okay, take a deep breath. Don't get overwhelmed. I try to look at it as, as one at a time right now because there isn't an answer. There's so much chaos in this arena of criminal justice reform right now. There's so much in the legislation that is happening that's so positive. The answer to that for me is humanity. Because I believe people want to do what's right and what's good. And when you expose light on it, you don't have to beat them up over the head with it. Just hearing it maybe and saying, you know what? Maybe as a DA, maybe as a prosecutor, maybe as a collective group, we can all sit around and look at ourselves and go, you know, let's go at this a little differently. Maybe we can all take a different approach. As a criminal justice initiative collectively, there are good things happening. Why do we have to make it such a political storm? Why can't we think about the people that are in it, the people that have been through it and sitting in it? And and what that greater picture is. Mm -hmm. And so the answer is, I don't think it's one big giant answer. I think collectively, it's all of us sitting back and, and looking this way instead of that way. And I know for me, the reason why that works is I I'm living proof of it. When I stopped looking outside of myself, when I stopped pointing at everything and everybody else, and taking responsibility and accountability, my life changed. And all my relationships and everything else is all the better for it. Mm. What a beautiful story, Nicole, and what beautiful work that you're doing to help those who really need it in such a vulnerable time. And I think what's also fascinating is that it opened your eyes to a world that you didn't know existed. It opened your eyes to treatment that you didn't know existed uh, because it was something you didn't experience. And so in many ways, because of that, you're able to connect on deeper levels to people that really need your help. So I think it's important work and I'm thankful that you're willing to share your story so openly um, and bravely. And, And I appreciate your work in that space What message do you want to leave with the audience? You know, I think the most important thing is that there's hope. We talk a lot in my story. I I share a lot of my past, you know, my childhood, the the things and and trauma and closing the cycle and the gap. But the biggest thing that I want people to hear, especially in the message of the accident and what happened and, and all of these events, these things that occurred, is that it's a life that's lived their chapters and the things that led up to this beautiful time now where there's hope and resilience that there was mistakes. I've made a lot of choices and decisions in my life, 
But all of those things led to this moment of freedom. It's really freedom because you can look at everything that's occurred and transpired and, and get mired down in negative. There was a time and a period in my life that was dark. And all of that led to this moment of just releasing the darkness and finding that hope and then in the light. And in the end, the biggest crowds and the moments and the times of friendships and people that I had in my life were the most lonely. And now this beautiful village of people and friends that I have that's relatively small is the most full and the most fulfilling. And that living my life every day to give that back is what's the most enriching. So I hope that by sharing, being transparent and putting myself out there encourages and gives hope and light to those out there that can relate. Oh, I'm sure it will. And where can people find you, Nicole? You can find me on rustydiamond.org. That's our website on the web. Also on Facebook. There's two different areas on Facebook. One that's really exciting. We have a group that we've started that is a private group that you can join. And when you go join that, uh, it'll send a request to me. That is for people that have been incarcerated. So the beauty there is you're sharing with other girls that have had the experience. And we have some pretty interesting conversations. <laughs> and then the, the Facebook group is Rusty Diamond Network. And then I'm also on Twitter. Now, that's just very interesting, as we all know, Twitter, which is how you and I, I think, yeah. first connected as well. So Twitter is always a great place. And that's Prison Diamond is on Twitter. I hope that you'll reach out on social media. I'm, I'm having a really good time getting to know people. And especially when people reach out with their stories or questions or, or just sharing things, especially when people have maybe a loved one incarcerated or maybe I've touched on a topic that they're interested in. Now, the things that are going on with Provo King at school, I've had even parents reach out, things like that. So like I said, I'm an open book and, and I look forward to being able to connect and, and interact with people. And you're reachable. Thank you you are, you're accessible and available on social media. We can definitely find you, <laughs> which is great. Yes. Well, yes. thank you, Nicole. This has been a privilege, privilege, truly. Oh, thank you as well. You're just great. And you know, all the stuff that you put out there, I love how you are putting great messages out there. And, and I encourage folks to go out and take a look at your other podcasts. And it's just such a blessing to connect with you. And, and I'm very grateful. I'm, I'm very careful about sharing because it, it's important. And I think it's important to get the, the messages out there. And so thank you for being a positive light. And for sharing a lot of these tough stories, these are difficult conversations and you handle them very well and you ask tough questions, but you put them in a way that is important for folks. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. And I appreciate that. Thank you. Have a good one. And we'll stay in touch. Thank you for listening to Tuesdays with Andrea. There are hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there, and I appreciate you making the time to listen to mine. If you like this show and want to know more, check out TuesdaysWithAndrea.com or please leave a review on iTunes or drop a line in the YouTube comment section. Until next time, please stay kind in your mind, nice on the web, and stay hella hopeful in your heart.